Good afternoon. Welcome to this breakout section. We are going to listen from Latin American religious affairs leaders. And we are grateful for your presence here and for our speakers for this afternoon. Uh, my name is Fabio Nascimento. I will just do some propaganda here. <laughs> if you see this, <laughs> this BYU Advocate magazine, I, it has a, an article that I wrote about religious freedom in Brazil. If you want to know more about religious freedom in Brazil, you can take that. It's around in the, at BYU. So we are doing this session in, in Spanish. Entonces, I will go, I'm so, going to to Spanish. So if you need the, your, use your speakers to, to listen in, in English or Portuguese or other language, you can do it now. Bienvenidos a esta. Welcome. Uh, este panel. We welcome you to this panel. Tenemos el alegría de escuchar. We are Elsa pleased to be able to hear Aguilar. from Elsa Fernandez Aguilar, who general director of is the general national director of Na the National Authority for Transparency and Access to Information from Panama. Después de Elsa, After Elsa, we will hear from Amador Sepulveda Garcia. He is an he is the uh, ministerial advisor from the National Office of Religious Affairs and of Chile. And then lastly, we will hear from Mr. Ignacio Cuevas. He is an advisor from the National Council to Prevent Discrimination in Mexico. And we also have, so Elsa, if you want to, uh, Go ahead. Muchas gracias. Thank you Fabio. to Fabio and also Ignacio and Amador. I'd like to express, express my desire, uh, to exp the opportunity to be here. My name is um, Elsa Fernandez, and I'd like to share with you this experience that I'm being allowed. I am very thankful to let Panama this space. Thank you to Karen Rodas, Brigham Young University, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints for this experience. Let me start with, with you that Panama is from Central America, 3.4 million people. Today, I will share with you in the next 15 minutes, it's to know the right recognition in Panama. Second, to analyze the right of freedom of religion and expression and also formulate statements and also the visit of Karen that happened after that. Also, according to our Constitution, you can see that every person can express their thoughts and these thoughts can be in word, written, or any other media. It is important to determine that this has some legal limitations like any or every other right. But when we talk about the freedom of expression, we want to say it in a, in a, way, in a direct way. When we talk about access to public information, we are talking about that every person has the right to present uh, before the public uh, service or uh, public services any question, any challenge they may have, and they have 30 days to receive an answer from the government. Why am I talking about this? It's because we need to be clear that it is required the participation of all the society and all elements of society. 
especially in all um, the uh, Punic Defender's Office. And this has to do with the state. First of all, we protect the, the, the community. So I am a public defender, and now I belong to a different entity that actually has to do with um, opening access to public information. In this way, we can have clarity and the relationship the two entities because based on the law, it guarantees the um, public participation. What does this have to do with freedom of expression or freedom of religion? First, freedom is transparency. And this transparency, it is achieved um, through the participation and the opportunity that every citizen has to express and participate in the decision that the government makes. If I want to question um, any organization within the government or a public servant in relation to the behavior um, that they took for the decision and is going to be implemented in the entire country, that's when the transparency becomes more important. And for citizens, transparency, it is the most important tool for um, every citizen. And they have the right because they do, they do participate. They are taxpayers. So they have the right to access for, to the information. To, and, and, you know, in relation to freedom of thought and freedom of religion. You, you probably have to relate this in every country, but this freedom produces information on freedom of religion, freedom of thought. And this information, it is important to have because it has to be public. If it's not public, then it is a problem. And this information, this data is information, and information is power. If we don't have that information and we are not civilized, then it will be very difficult to create public public policy that protects these different groups. Another thing is to protect the personal information. For the last few years, Panama has um, a program to uh, organize all the personal information for all citizens. This information has several classifications. Some of those are classified more sensitive. One of those sensitive information is my religion, because if it is known, I could be discriminated against um, if it's not managed correctly. So this is important to know um, that the state needs to regulate and administer correctly. Another thing that we can talk is I highlighted there, it's, it's um, a government model where government talk to the citizens and create public policy based on necessities. These public servants need to um, obtain and develop policies in favor of the citizens. There are mechanisms through the access to the information, and it has to do with the citizens. Public can request the information. They can do it through forums. And this is what we did in our government. Members of a group of the government created policies about sexuality. There was a, a religion group that attended to these uh, discussions that also approved of these policies. And this is how dialogue can start. Another uh, thing that it is important is that there are mechanisms that we can question um, policies. Through these, citizens can um, question, for example, a certain subsidy for schools because there are some schools that are based on religions. 
So a citizen can actually question this policy um, if there are benef benef benefits for um, schools that are based on religions or not, and they send the hands the same 30 days to receive the answer. Following this example is that when there are no obedience to the law, we can seek for a penalty. And these are the two areas of this entity. First is access to the information and also for personal information. In relation to public servants, for example, we have um, brought charges to 12 public servants because they have not obeyed this protection to personal information. In relation to the religion, it is included in the Article 35 of our Constitution is that they are freedom for all religions. In in this particular case, the government is responsible to assign an, in, an entity to protect this. Um, so the Secretary of State is responsible um, to ensure that um, religions can be a legal institution and develop all the rights of any other legal institution in the country. It is important to share with you a little bit of Panama. As you can see, we practice several religions. There are Catholic, Catholics, Prot 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 Protestants, um, Witness of Jehovah, Mormons, um, Muslims, Jewish. According to the Constitution, we know that, and especially because our inheritance from Spain, our Constitution indicates that the, um, the, church, the Catholic Church um, indicates that we are all Christians. But there is there is an ecumenic um, entity that oversees this. And all of these entities in Panama have a continuous dialogue and then continue to join to work through all the challenges. There are four uh, religious universities, the Christian University, the Catholic University. There is 178 um, educational centers based on religion, and there's over 4,000 um, cen educational centers, but 178 are religion-based um, educational institutions. I wanted you to know that. We have some um, guarantees um, of freedom of religion. And in this way, um, the government allows all community that uh, they, they like a representative, they can receive a representative from the government. And in this way, we are guaranteeing this right. Recently, I met with the defensor um, from the government, and we discussed the freedom of, of religion. Um, and in particular, there is a topic that we discuss, um, the example that relates to you that they are developing a policy about uh, sexual expression. And just to finish my uh, my words, they are, there is an entity from the government that protects beliefs and also are in, in, the, in personal information. Privacy. This um, information is, is personal and is related to our uh, human rights, and it has to be preserved. It has to be included in data privacy laws. As an example, we have guides that we have developed in relation to these topics. They are treatment of information for uh, uh, minors, uh, treatment of information for women, elderly, uh, handicapped. All of these are challenges that we are um, confronting. And this is another way that we can develop protection for these rights.
y la transparencia parte del punto the de transparency is, is, a key, is a key to develop public policies. And this is when we develop public policies of open information. One of the most recent aspects that I asked uh, in writing to the um, government controller, if, the, if there was an um, information about asking this question um, for all the, 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 the community. And I, I told him that I need to ask this question so I can trust uh, the policy. Because if you don't have sufficient information about if this question is being asked, you're just assuming and this is not, that is not correct. Because in relation to health and education, yeah, those questions can be asked. But if there are other questions that are um, that has to do, for example, working on Sundays based because of religion or other religions that pr uh, prevent from sharing blood. Um, those are the things that I need to understand. Like in my case, I am a Christian and I'm a Catholic. These are some of the aspects that I need to understand in relation to the public policy, in relation to also um, uh, re religious policy, and we need to trust this the, the, the system, because I need to share um, these topics for uh, somebody else, uh, Dr. Mari Carmen Plata. We are countries that are um, that have the, oh, the organization of American states. Every one of us uh, receives some reality from them, and from this point, we organize ourselves to implement um, the initiatives. But it is important to listen to you that we, as a society, can transmit this idea. Even if we are part of the state, we can um, uh, provide a space for these organizations. And also to create public po uh, policies, we need to visualize more. Thank you, Karen, for this opportunity because to discuss the access to the information, I knew about it, but I didn't have the experience. And when we don't know something, we, don't, we cannot understand it. So we need to develop a guide to manage sensitive information, data privacy. My information cannot be everywhere because I, be, I could be exposed to discrimination. That's what countries need guides to manage the sensitive information. I participate in an organization who are developing this type of uh, guides and protocols. We have to put it in writing. We have to create these guides in writing and digital forms. So it is good to share with you. And I'd like to finish uh, my remarks with this is from Mother Teresa. And then she says that in this life, I'm going to go through once. But all the kindness that I can do to others, I have to do it today. Because I do not go through this earth twice. So the opportunity to make all these decisions and the reason to be here today is religion, is what we have heard today. When we talk about uh, religion, it is internal. And this contributes to be a society. Because if we are deprived from religious freedom, we are being deprived for uh, human assistance. So thank you for the opportunity. God bless. Ricardo Spencer te va a quitar la tarjeta. Muy buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Es realmente grato compartir este espacio. It's truly a pleasure to uh, 
be here, and I am very grateful. According to the United Nations, the focus of the 75th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, among others, consists of declaring human rights and for the purpose of increasing knowledge about the universality and the indivisibility of human rights. This means that in order to promote and protect human rights, we need additional measures that can be concrete and that will make it possible to deal with the various problems that we have in the world, but it needs to be one that will include all of society, the participation of all of society. And uh, with regard to the 2030 uh, Sustainable Development Goals, this is the uh, way to continue as we deal with the various challenges that we have since the foundation of the United Nations and the UDHR. And also for the new challenges that have arisen and that affect us um, as, as time goes by. And a clear example is the uh, global issues with the climate changes that has had a major effect in my country. As our President Gabriel Boric von said several years ago, during the 78th uh, UN Assembly in New York. And uh, by the way, as we are talking about the various anniversaries that are converging this year, this is a, was an important meeting. And our country has, on September 11th, commemorated the 50th anniversary of the um, military coup against Salvador Allende Gómez, who was the president at the time. And this gave rise to the most cruel dictator that we've had in our country in the last 60 years and which set the course of the history of our nation and where the search for truth and justice and um, a guaranteeing for no repetition has been extremely important. The great convergences of humanity, which we heard from uh, Bishop Yaguzzo, uh, not too long ago, has often been accompanied by, accompanied by violence and genocide. In our case, it was a uh, military civil dictatorship, dictatorship and uh, worldwide it was World War II, which created an historical, was an historical point during the 20th century. There is, there is now a, a before and an after in terms of how the nations um, interrelate. These are things that can cause us to improve or to uh, make things worse. The, Univer the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is a positive and democratic way to find ways that will lead us to uh, peace. And uh, just as our recent history has shown, now in Chile, in 1925, was when the state and and government, I mean, when state and churches were officially separated, and a secular state was declared. And this separation has been understood in various ways, and it has been difficult to specify. But unfortunately. Often it has been considered an act of uh, discrimination that privatized, that, that uh, took away faith from people and which emphasized uh, public areas, government areas, and faith. And this is the scenario that we were, we are now in almost 100 years later as a government, where uh, the uh, government tries to marginalize people's uh, religion from the public sphere, as though it were possible to uh, isolate religion to uh, one's home, where it would be left in, in a box or maybe in a church somewhere and leave the faith hidden somewhere. The conviction of our government in Chile is quite contrary to this conception, and in our opinion, spirituality and the religiosity of people as part of uh, the everyday decisions that humans make, and which in fact are motivated and caused by their deepest religious feelings. Freedom of uh, conscience and freedom of religion are included in this public space, and so these are things that need to be present 
as part of the development of the public policy of nations. As we develop public policy, there's a clear suggestion and insistence on the fact that we need to include the majority of society as we develop public policies. Religion, religion cannot be an exception to this case. In this regard, we find it relevant to point out that we cannot go backwards either, which unfortunately has happened in many countries in the world and in our region. It is not acceptable that public policy is constructed based on religious conviction or lack thereof of the uh, current political leader. This needs to be based on neutrality, and that, in fact, is what positive secularism is all about. And one of the most relevant areas in terms of the declaration by the UN has to do with the universality of human rights and their indivisible nature. We cannot question any human right for anyone, let alone when it comes to uh, exercising one's freedom, because this is inherent in human dignity, and it is a part of the very universal declaration of human rights, the establishment of neutrality and positive secularism, and on the other hand, having a uh, supposition that does not include various differences in the government, we've been able to strengthen our work in interfaith dialogue. The most pristine way in which we can express these two basic principles, which say uh, the relationship with the uh, government and its institution as, uh, as a guarantor, as one, uh, one more, dialoguing participant, and then spirit, the spirituality which is present in our country. This requires that we consider the neutrality of the state as the basis to promote and protect dialogue between faith and the state. In the midst of this conversation, the following question arises. What are we dialoguing about? One of the reflections that we have developed causes us to focus on in the initial dialogue on something that is of interest both for religious entities as well as for the um, Chilean government. The search for the common good. We looked at uh, the importance for what is important for religion also. I'm not going to cite philosophical or doctrinal errors because things are just going to end up wrong. On the other, quite the contrary, needs to reflect what we do in our everyday lives, our basic task at hand in um, the common things, the things we do in society, and these reflections made us conclude that community, communities, faith communities, churches, are characterized by being the, the level one priorities. There are common things that are expressed within the faith-based area with respect to the vulnerability of the rest, or like we Christians say, love for one's neighbor, one's concern for one's neighbor. This concern is shared by the state and its various institutions and agencies and authorities and public officials at all the different levels. Uh, and in fact, the purpose of um, politics is the common good and the vulnerability of individuals gives rise to a conversation between faith and the state and also makes it possible to have uh, uh, success in, 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 in faith-based dialogue because if we start fr from the things that bring us together, the things we have in common in these dialogues can uh, strengthen the democracies of our countries, uh, which we have in uh, Chile and Latin America, as we have the saying that uh, at the table we should not talk about neither religion or politics nor soccer. But on the contrary, we actually need to talk about those topics. We have to be able to talk about those topics. And the results have been surprising. In the various catastrophes that we've had in our country in 2021, 22, and 23, we have managed to develop an an emergency interfaith network where the various faith-based organizations that uh, carry out humanitarian work can be paired up with uh, 
rescue work, and this has made it possible to uh, to uh, bring uh, various types of financial and other resources, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has definitely been one of the greatest supporters in this effort. But they've not done it alone. They've done it together with uh, government, uh, national, regional and local government organizations together with various rescue uh, operators to handle these different disasters that are affecting us at um, more and more often every day. We have this uh, space for dialogue, which we call the interfaith um, space for dialogue. And so we're going to inaugurate interfaith dialogue at the international level, which will make it possible to establish the basis for having this religious conversation that we have had with regard to the spirituality of our country. So what is the purpose of this? That we can start talking about public policy in Chile. And this is what we would like to do. And this need, of course, to be sustained at a table where we can uh, speak together as equals and uh, with a state which must maintain absolute neutrality with regard to the faith of people. And then finally, we have a, concern, a, a point of concern and an invitation. In the Chilean government and at the government level, we believe that it is necessary to uh, enter into dialogue and regarding these topics in an urgent manner in the Americas. And this will enable us to look at the uh, perspectives within our states on this continent and also to find proposals that will favor dialogue and so that we can uh, eliminate uh, the hate speech which are affecting the most vulnerable of, of, among our populations. And I want to finish by um, a, this poem by a Lutheran priest at the end of World War II with regard to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And he said, when the Nazis came to take the communists, I kept silent, for I was not a communist. And when they jailed the social democrats, I said nothing, for I was not a social democrat. And so when they came to, for the uh, union Unionists, then I did not protest, for I was not in a union. When they came for the Jews, I said nothing, for I was not a Jew. When they came for me, there was no one left to defend me. We're at a time when our governments have the responsibility to establish a basis for future dialogue, as otherwise our people will suffer the consequences of our failure. And just to paraphrase what the Chilean president said, Gabriel Boric Font, in the United Nations uh, just a few days ago, he said, I conclude by saying, dear ladies and gentlemen, you can count on Chile to promote and defend human rights, multilateralism, democracy, and together create sustainable devil, uh, development and greater social equality. Our country and our government and the National Office for Religious Affairs of Chile is at your disposal to carry out this work that uh, the uh, President of the United Nations, that our President said in the United Nations, and which I also join in this important symposium. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, everybody. To me, it is an honor. It's almost a dream to be here. I've been here 20 years working in religious affairs and po political affairs in Mexico. I was an advisor in um, religious affairs in the government, and I have been for several years in the National Council to Prevent Discrimination. I have been here, my words have been here, because everybody who came from Mexico, from the 
um, secretary, I wrote their talks. They never invited me, but I was the, the speech writer. So you heard my words before. But now, finally, I have the chance to come. Last year, I didn't have a visa, but the Lord works in mysterious ways. I am very happy to be here. I am honored. And the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, they are a force, an active force in Mexico. We are the country with the second country with the greatest members in the church. And I cannot say that this was this territory was Mexico. And um, when they, <laughs> when, uh, it's not that there were nobody to uh, to welcome uh, the pioneers, but we weren't that many. We were such as far away. And then there was a war, and uh, you know the story. But we're here, and uh, we're very happy to be here. My presentation. Uh, at the end, when we come to these symposiums, we have certain expectations uh, because we uh, we here have to present. But when we are ready to present, we present, and that's it. Um, it is not a good thing that we are at the end because it's more pressure. But we're here. I like to focus on discrimination. That's what I was asked, and this is what I, we have seen. But there's a new element that we use is discrimination. We didn't use this word before. Um, and we have been trying to link this word and human rights. Well, when we start with the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, we all know about it. We've read it before. I just like to uh, remind you the article, the first article is everyone has been born freedom and have the rights of conscience and the opportunity to relate with each other. And this applies to all human beings. Doesn't matter what characteristics we hold. Through those characteristics, discrimination can happen. When we are categorizing, dividing, creating distinctions, it should not happen because the first article is telling us that we shouldn't have it. And when it comes to religion, everybody should have, uh, we should have the freedom regardless of such a race, color, sex, language, religion, political, or other opinion, national, social, origin, property. You know, no one should be discriminated against for any reason. Everyone should be equal before the law. In our entire, without discrimination to equal protection of the law, all are entitled of equal protection against discrimination, violation of this declaration, and against any um, ins incitement of such discrimination. So, what does this mean? Is to close the door to someone. That's discrimination. When somebody is being discriminated against, it's been told you cannot be here. You cannot be in this school. You cannot go to the hospital. You cannot buy this. The question is why those doors are closed to someone. And that's what we need to fight against. We need to give them the key to open those doors. And, and, and no one, like we say in my countries, no one should be left outside or behind. Now we are in the topic of religion. And, and religion has experienced all kinds of discrimination, uh, and, and there are a lot of topics that can relate to discrimination, and we'll be here for a long time. But in Mexican Constitution, we have developed this correctly. The first article of Mexican Constitution, uh, Panamanian Constitution is really good, but the first article, we talk about human rights. The, the what Mexican Constitution starts with human rights. We used to call it different. Right? It's individual guarantees. We didn't use the word human rights. But there is now a point all people should enjoy human rights in this Constitution and any other international treaties. 
All those national international treaties that are related to our Constitution, they have the same force to protect the human rights. And in that article, uh, the last paragraph, it says, it is forbidden all discrimination based on um, um, all the right, all the reasons that I mentioned, like sex, religion, origin, opinion, sexual preference, um, social status, or any other reason against um, any human being. So if we cannot discriminate, but in Mexico we do discriminate, just like any other country. Some of the countries probably not as much because they're advanced, but that is reality. Particularly in Mexico, since we already talked about this, uh, and we talk, we also talk about um, the religion, our article number 24 in the Constitution discusses religion. Um, and it was very fortunate because it was, um, it's just the freedom from a religion, but it's not just religion, but it's beliefs ethics, moral principles. Like like he said, we live with our religion. We want to express it, we want to share it, not only religion, but the values. And we should be freed to do this. However, um, the religions who do that cannot pretend imposing those principles in the society. That is also, it is important to identify. In the article 130, which is, is just a topic of analysis for many people in Mexico, it divides the religion from the state. Before it was state and church, Catholic, and now there are many churches, but now it's a state, church, and religious communities, because we have all kinds. There's a little bit of everything, but we have a lot of them. So that's the Mexican reality. We also discussed that yesterday. Just like most Latin American countries with Catholic origins, a strong one, and then a clash in cultures between Mexi uh, Mexican culture and, and Catholics and maybe also the indigenous backgrounds as well. Because in Mexico, we eat tamales. And that comes from, uh, from a religious principle. Um, like in Mexico, there was a belief that when someone was going to give birth, she has to be you know, protected for 40 days. And at the end, we eat tamales. So. So, uh, probably not everybody go now with the virgin, uh, because now it's just something individual, but the, the Mexican culture, it's, it's, it's mixed with all of this. But it is important to know that we are learning at the end of Ramadan um, and other things that are also Mexican parties. And then we also share our piñatas with them. Uh, well, tell me any other place that doesn't have piñatas to enjoy themselves in the community. El de Yankee Pur, and those are th those are celebrations in Mexico, and we want to include them. And soon, th there will be the burning of the tree, which also may become a Mexican celebration as well. Um, uh, of the Church of Jesus Christ, but it's part of the culture. So the Mexican Mexican state is trying to identify where it makes the highlight, because religion has to be in public. Where can we highlight this? Maybe in the official area. Um, when we transfer power in Mexico, it has nothing to do with religion. Um, the the court the court system has nothing to do with religion, but in in Mexico is like that. It is mixed. It doesn't that doesn't mean that the Buddha is saying that religion cannot be in public. But where do we limit that division in the electoral process? They cannot be candidates or. Um, or religious leaders. He has to. He has to choose. 
if you want to be a member of the Congress, you cannot be a religious leader at the same time. That's what I want to focus my attention. The first article of the Mexican Constitution indicated that there has to be a federal law to prevent discrimination. And that was created in Mexico. So we have a law, a special law. And it indicates it's just not just one lay, but it's just a council. It's a national council to prevent discrimination on decentralized uh, or a group body to prevent with uh, to to uh, protect uh, our national assets. They're not that many, but we, we do have we do have them. We need to protect them. In in relation to prevent discrimination. Okay. But if you're interested in learning more about this, uh, we have the uh, Guanapared webpage, which has a lot of information on all the uh, publications which are free of charge. There's also a list of the uh, uh, groups uh, that are vulnerable to discrimination. There are a lot of the indigenous groups, the uh, African Mexican groups, uh, the elderly uh, women, which is kind of a circus there, that majority. Um, those of uh, sexual diver diverse of sexual diversities. We can't take their rights away either. Um, the underage, the uh, people who uh, work as maids. And so all of these, and, then the, and, and among them are the religious groups. But from all of these people, well, we need to make sure that they're not discriminated against, but the religious groups are there. And of course, they cannot be discriminated against, but these religious groups, not only do we need to um, to take care of them, we also need to invite them because they can help us to combat discrimination. And that's why, in fact, the um, Jewish community uh, helped us a lot, uh, Mr. Uh, Guillermo Mangado helped us, uh, and that's also what Marco told us this morning. Uh, discrimination begins with the Jews, and then it continues, and, and they know all about that. And so this is uh, all very important. And well, we decided to act with the religious groups. We uh, created our own council. There are councils in all the various states, but we created a group called religions for inclusion, because what we want is to include everyone. And, uh, and this, well, this is kind of crazy, but, uh, you know, there's the Roman Catholic Church that we've been, f that we fought with so many times because we've had to uh, complain about the homophobic uh, speeches that they give because, uh, which is not good because if, if they don't agree with uh, same-sex marriage, they can express that by, but with respect and not saying that it's the same as marrying animals. I mean, things like that are, you know, okay. I mean, yeah, you have the freedom of expression, all that, of course, but, uh, you know, there are kind of, there are certain limits, you know. So it's been difficult, but there it is. The Catholic Church, the um, Roman Catholic Church is there, uh, and the secretary in charge of that is with us well as the Jews and the Church of Jesus Christ is there. Uh, Gustavo, who uh, invited us, is uh, there, uh, and various churches and religious communities and, uh, and everyone. And so um, we have um, priestesses, which consists of a lesbian couple, and they are exploring or reevaluating re the religious groups of the uh, Wicca religious group and so we all talk together and they uh, attend the various uh, activities held by Apret and some will say hey I'm not I'm not going to be a part of that well that's just fine but as you can see uh, the position of Mexico has changed quite a bit and during the uh, current uh, administration in Mexico and, and I've been working with this for a while and you know all of this was kind of a political matter we needed to make sure that no one caused any problems, so that they should defend these and the others, and everything was okay then. But that's not how it is now. Currently, religious affairs means let's invite all these religious groups because Mexico is in the midst of an enormous crisis of violence. And so it's great that the uh, attitude in Mexico is in, including all these religious groups, uh, and that's because we need the religious groups. We need this, they are of enormous value to society and they have so much to contribute and so we welcome them and so that's what we're doing and I'm very grateful for your attention. Thank you.